Welcome back to the Levity Zone. I would like to introduce you to a special group of people, the Jellicoe Literary Guild, founded in New Britain, Connecticut in 1988, where meetings were held for 13 years. In 2008, it relocated to Portland, Oregon, and finally to Metro Boston in 2010. Its meetings have featured many writers, artists, and musicians sharing their works in an atmosphere of genial, collaborative peers. In recent times, many contributors, such as yours truly, Dr. Bruce, have been able to contribute by proxy, whether offering writing, pictures, audio, or video. Host of the Guild meetings, Raymond Soulard, who I have known for several years, invited me to pose a question that would be taken up for their meeting in April 2014. As you will hear, a spirited discussion resulted with many points of view and, to my ear, some unique approaches to the question of whether we can, should, or would remake our communities. One thing to note for those not from New England, one speaker refers to evidence for group consciousness being that everyone can somehow drive safely through a rotary. Well, a rotary is the local expression for a traffic circle, or roundabout in some countries. So now let's get going with Raymond introducing me virtually, playing the recording of my choice of question for the group, and then the group's deliberations. Okay, so I have this friend named uh, Bruce Damer. I, he's going to probably introduce himself at more length, but um, he's a guy that uh, worked for NASA for a while. He does all sorts of things. He's, he's well-known. He like goes to Burning Man a lot and gives talks on sort of new-agey kind of topics, but he has a good science background, so his topics tend to at least be semi-grounded in sensible stuff. <laughs> and um, he has a podcast. He has an online thing that he does. But he's also started doing these um, gatherings, these salons, where people get together and they discuss sort of the big topics, like philosophical type mm -hmm. things. And he's always kind of like trying to figure out, well, more people should do this kind of thing. Sit around, bring up the big questions, and discuss them. You know, okay. put, put your ideas out there, see, you know, make the world more interesting and less uh, full of bullets. And so we've been, we've been talking about collaborating for a while. So I said, Bruce, I, I will donate a round of the Jellicle Guild to you, to your thoughts and ideas. You record for me something an open-ended kind of statement or observation or something, mm -hmm. and whoever comes that night, we'll, we'll, we'll chat it up for a while. We'll see how, where it takes us. We'll just, you know, we'll listen to your thoughts. We'll see if anything comes of it. Oh, cool. And so he thought it was a fantastic idea. I said, if it really works out well, you can use it for your podcast. You can throw it out there, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I said, introduce yourself and give a little context and then jump into your, you know, your thoughts. So here we go. Hello, my name is Dr. Bruce Damer, and I'm sitting here at Ancient Oaks Farm in the Santa Cruz Mountains of Northern California talking to the Jellicle Guild out there in the New England patriotic part of our country. And thank you, Raymond, for inviting me to address or to talk to the group. The first question that Raymond asked is uh, the work I do. I do work that combines vision and science in combination to create what I'm hoping is hope, or what I'm calling levity. So uh, next, Raymond asks a question of the Levity Zone Salon Project. And what it is, is the Levity Zone is the podcast that I finally got started in 2012, which Terrence McKenna had encouraged me to start going out and bringing some of these wild ideas, or he called them funny ideas, uh, to the world. And to some degree, it's an extension of Terence's own thought, but just out into the future. But certainly a lot of my own, own stuff. So The Zone, as we call it, has 25 shows now. It has public talks that I've done, uh, talks that I've done with others. Uh, the works of R.P. Kaushik, John Suntiger. Voices that I think have a hopeful view of the future despite all the storm and drama of what the human enterprise is all about. Certainly there's a lot of people covering the dark side, and I figured we needed a little bit more levity. So in deference to Terrence, 
little less novelty in the world is enough novelty for us, but we need levity, which is a feeling of lightness, openness, uh, hope. Uh, so that's the Levity Zone podcast, and Raymond is kindly uh, rebroadcasting it on his internet radio show. We've recently started hosting in-person groups where we rediscover the art of conversation. Then those conversations are recorded and really edited carefully but seriously edited down so that there's really just the wonderful nuggets of the great utterances and the great aha moments that go out into the podcast. I'm surrounded here by a library of books on philosophy, the Nag Hammadi Library, the Rubriat of of Kumar, Terence's books, the Codex Seraphinianus. You know, this room is just full of that kind of thing, and it's really to reconnect us with our roots rather than what's currently on Facebook or YouTube, which I think most of that stuff is pretty shallow and ephemeral, fleeting. So all that said, uh, what is the question that would be wonderful if the group surrounding Raymond, when you meet there at his house, what is a question to discuss? Well, I think one of the questions is, could we as a species have undergone a change where when we were insectivores living in the rainforest canopy 60 million years ago, we would have lived like insectivores in balls, uh, in clumps uh, for protection and warmth, and then gone out on hunting expeditions for dragonflies and lotus petals and uh, tree sap, and we had basically a burger, uh, fries, and a shake diet back then. But we were very close, and eye contact and personal interaction and personal touch was very, very important for our species for its 60, 70 million year run from the proto-primate and the ancestor of all primates and lemurs and monkeys all the way up till now, in which we no longer are so close in this sort of Western ideal and now pretty much everywhere of the person as the sole journeyer on the hero's journey alone. Uh, this is a very unnatural state from our evolutionary perspective. So is it possible that we could return to this very close state where instead of us driving in our cars to work, being separate in our little media caves, consuming our stuff in our heads for the most part, uh, if you look at a crowd of people walking out of the subway in New York, everyone's just lost in thoughts and very separate. Could we rediscover the idea and the experience of being very close to a group? Uh, a mother and child certainly have an incredibly close bond that most men can't understand. But could we, in our medicine ceremonies, in our yogic meditative ceremonies, could we attempt to come into a circle and to reestablish the group mind where you get out of your own little processing, your own little dishwashing operation, your own little thoughts and to-do lists, and you lose yourself in the group. This could be done through music, could be done through psychoactive substances, could be done through chanting, could be done through just simple touch, hugging in a group. Um, there's that wonderful candle which shows everyone arm in arm, and then you light the candle in between them. Uh, could we, as a society, rediscover that? And if we can, can that help change our lives? So instead of being worried about your mortgage payment and your career ladder and the, the latest thing you wanted to buy that it wasn't delivered that morning, uh, instead you throw that all off and you say, none of that matters. That's all mind creation. What matters is my connection to my species, my earth, uh, and the life, the time that I've been gifted to be alive. And so I want to look around and see the eyes of the loved ones and feel completely protected in that bubble. I'm protected, therefore, from the crazy news media stories, which is just other crazy monkeys in their heads that are reflecting and chattering loudly like monkeys do in the forest and scream when they see something. And then they upset all the other monkeys. It's really not much different. But you're protected from that. If you're in your eye contact group, in your physical contact group, you feel like the, uh, the ox in the musk oxen where they surround the young in the high Arctic. So could we do that? Could we 
actually reinstill the idea of intense group closeness. And is this happening now? Are you able to go to the festivals and experience that? Do you experience that in your church? Do you experience that in your family, in your closest group of buddies? And what does that feel like? And could we do this on a regular basis to reestablish our protection and our independence from the mania of the mind that is surrounding us and on all sides, from the commute experience to the commercial experience to the office setup and the politics of the office to the craziness of the stories we're being told and telling each other? Could we establish a safe zone away from that by getting close and by when your mind turns off, you realize, oh, I'm sinking into a bigger thing, a much bigger thing than I've ever experienced, which is I'm now lost or I'm found into a group. And it's a totally different reality. When this has happened to me, it's been what a relief from myself and from my solo warrior's journey. I'm part of a unit. For me personally, when they've experienced this, it's been one of the greatest breakthroughs because it makes all life make sense. There's no longer the serial killer at the edge of the night anymore because you're in your group. There's no longer the immediate sense that you're going to be out on the street financially. No, because you're in a group. There's no more fear of death. Why? Because you're in the group and the group takes care of you, but a group goes on and the group is what matters. And you are an individual that will propagate and perpetuate within your group. It's just a whole other way that we gave up tens of thousands of years ago, not too long ago, based on our evolution. We, we gave that up. And can we return to it? So I hope that this provides some grist for the mill there in the salon that will be held somewhere in the Boston area. And I do hope you record it because then we can put it onto the levity zone and feature all of uh, your voices as we take this up. So can we return to the group? Can we return to the circle, eye contact, put those phones away, and uh, just be with human beings before we all become uh, a highly distracted on the uh, autism continuum forever? and only looking into the gaze of technology for all of our interactions. Thank you. This is Dr. Bruce signing off, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye. All right, Bruce. So, Bruce, we heard your audio, your explanation of who you are, and um, your questions. And uh, by way of response, I'll say this is Raymond, and here's Cassie, Victor, Joe, Rick, and Melissa. And... We've heard your words. We'll see what comes in response. Victor. No pressure. Jeez. <laughs> I don't know. I think we already have an organization like that. It's called a family. Yeah. And we don't have to cast back tens of thousands of years to circle the wagon, so to speak. It, uh, I mean, just to call your mom instead. It's kind of the same thing. What about the technology thing he was talking about? Technology? Uh, how? He seemed to be saying that technology was sort of a an interference. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. I mean, but that's what allows this to happen. It's true, it's true. We would not be uh, doing whatever we are doing right now. We would not be having a discussion which this fellow on the other side of the country right, could possibly yeah. hear without technology. But I don't think he's talking about this use of technology. I think he's talking about, like... Technology where, uh, like what you were talking about when you were in the Minnesota airport and everybody's sitting right, there. Yeah, that flash of that. It's like it was exactly that. But it's, yeah, it's, it's all just interference with, with the family unit, you know, your, your little community, your little tribes and everything. It's like, I don't think you have to go back that far. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to go back that far to see where shit really starts to fall apart. So where does it fall apart? Uh, Probably when uh, we started using the engines. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Joe? I, I hope the, the answer is, is, is yes. Uh, but responding to Victor's comment, the, the, the family unit cannot be presupposed to be a source of closeness in all cases. Mm -hmm. And I think one's history within a family unit might prejudice their approach to the whole notion of closeness yeah. and their ability to be truly open, intimate, and uh, 
giving and sharing. And selfless, which I think is one of the very nice and attractive qualities of what Dr. is, you know, is, is suggesting, you know, and hoping for. Yeah. Rick? Yeah, I was thinking about the same thing. I think his idea, to me, is very Buddhist. I think he's saying, on one level, you need to obliterate the ego. Mm-hmm. And if you obliterate the ego, then you don't feel that self-importance. You don't feel necessarily a division among other people. But I think that where we are at now in terms of 2014, it's very, very complex in terms of the economics of the world. I think that has to play in a big part. I mean, it's, I don't know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a cynic, I'm not a pessimist, but I think major, major economic changes would have to occur globally for us to even begin to get to a state whereby we have that sort of cocoon-like feeling because, let's face it, you know, we are all, wherever we live on the planet now, under great, great duress just to keep a roof over our head. And to keep the roof over our head daily, we have to make choices that compromise ideas of connection and kindness. I mean, to me, it comes down to another way, because I think it's like, uh, you know, many people have said, on their deathbed, like, what do you regret in, in your life? And often people say, I wish I were kinder. Yeah. And that, I think, is what is the, you know, makes us ultimately human, is a certain, you know, selflessness, compassion, kindness, all those things which Buddhists and other religions talk about. So, I don't, I'm a little confused as to what he is envisioning. Uh, maybe he's asking us what we would think would produce a change of yeah. that sort. I think that's what he's asking. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I, I don't think there's any cure for the condition of being human. And by that <laughs> I mean that we're always going to be up against, I believe, the eternal forces of compassion and kindness and not understanding, uh, being flawed because we are human. So there's this constant, in my, my view of the world, there's this constant interplay between trying to get it right and missing it. Mm-hmm. We're, we're the sons of Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. It's a complex question, and, it, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I'd have to think more deeply about it to perhaps get more clear about what it would entail. But uh, I don't know. I, mean, I look at, you know, living in an urban environment, you're encountering... Strangers. We were talking about the train yeah. earlier. Yeah. I mean, there are people who you don't know, and how do you treat that person? Do you treat that person with kindness and love, or do you treat them as though they're inanimate and just should be pushed aside? So, And, and people do different things in, in that very yeah, stressed out yeah, environment. Yeah, some yeah. people are kind. Right. They'll right. smile right at you. They'll some, some, of some, of is, some of them is beyond our control, though. That's I mean, another thing. Some point. of them is because of our own biologies and, yeah, you know, know, just the... You know, so much of it is beyond, is beyond our control. I think. I think we have. To, I, I don't believe in in the idea of free will. I, I really strongly think there is no such thing as free will. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Everything has already been said. <laughs> and ah. to work. What makes you say that? <laughs> just a just a thought. Just a thought. I think we have the illusion of free will. But I don't think there is such a thing as free will. You missed the joke. Well, <laughs> I hate you, Joe. <laughs> no, one other thought that comes to me, I don't want to interrupt the change, but just before I lose this thread, is that he's positing that, that there can exist a heaven on earth, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's just not possible. I don't think that that, well, however you want to define creator, God, cosmic force that has brought these energies together, I think that is inimical to the whole process because I think that yeah, that's what life makes as we out. know it, there's a certain tension and, and uh, you know, dialogue between what works and what doesn't. And, and there's a, an unfathomable, beyond our human comprehension, understanding of why things are the way they are. And I think, in a certain way, I appreciate his question immensely, and yeah. it's something I think about a lot. Yeah. But I think it's a slippery slope to think that we, as mortals, are going to, all of a sudden, in some evolution, I don't really 
And I'm not a cynic. I'm a person who tries to refine my love and my kindness. But I don't really believe in an age of Aquarius or whatever you want to call it, whereby we are able to, as a species, come to this place where everything is worked out. We'd have to all agree. Every, every We'd have to all agree. Every action is an altruistic action. Because that runs counter to uh, survival of species. You don't think we're like ants, that we have that sort of collective unconscious that, uh, and that connects us in a way. Uh, I personally don't. I mean, just my life experience seeing levels of disharmony and I mean, as I get older, I see daily in the world things that make me think, yeah, you know, we've evolved, but well, once again, my idea of the cosmic force behind it all is, is there's going to be a perpetual evolution to different, perhaps, levels of better understanding, but I don't know if we can ever get to a state... Yeah, but that's that sort of a linear thinking model, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. saying that everything's always going to get better, and it doesn't mm -hmm. work like that. No, it's not linear, and time is sort of an illusion in a sense, too, but in a sense it's not, that you're always going to... You can only go forward in our time frame, but... Um, so, should I... Yeah, 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 yeah um, please do. No, I'm just, I, I, you know, when I think of this, I, I sort of, I mean... I think it would be very helpful to, in some ways to create these um, tribes or to have a tribe. And I don't feel that I really do. I mean, I think that we are living in a pretty compartmentalized world. Unless you grew up in a small town where everyone stayed in that town, and even then, is that a tribe? That might be oppressive in some way. It might not mm -hmm. be the tribe you want. It could be. Um, and... Um, you know, I think we create certain kinds of tribal events. Like, I think out loud we have this open mic. Like, there's a little bit of a tribal, you know, there, there's a coming together that happens there. That's community. Yeah. You know, um, I think that because I've grown up in, you know, North America and I um, have moved a lot as a kid and, you know, I just feel that, um, you know, I've always sort of, uh, it's been, always been elusive for me. The yeah, sense of community has always been elusive. Um, Either I have people very close to me, like family, or people kind of at a distance, and I always sort of try to bridge that a little bit. And um, in my work, working with serious mental illness, I try to create community for people, and then try to help link them to other communities. And it's a really real challenge. When I ask, actually asked one of our leaders, and was from the central office in Washington, I guess he was suggesting we can sort of just send people out into the community, and I was, I'm saying, you know, do you really think that there is... Um, in general, a really viable community for people. And he said, oh, yeah, I think so. It's a simply blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, I sort of think there is, if you find it and you're lucky to find it, um, I think it's really sparse. Um, and then in terms of technology, I think in terms of, like, the little bit I know about Lacan, which isn't a lot, but um, for a while I was kind of studying that in terms of my past experience with being in a relationship with someone who became internet addicted and just was completely completely fell into the computer and could not be retrieved. And um, so I am studying that and I, I you know I think that there's a point to, to saying that technology has sort of digitalized us and you see it in a lot of contexts. You see it in um, well you see it in work settings, like for example, working in mental health, all of a sudden they wanted to call, you know, we're all practitioners, which seems like being an artisan of sorts, you know, when you're doing the psychotherapy and some there's a, a spiritual element to it, there's a knowledge element, there's art, there's science, all put it together and they're creating the practice. And um, all of a sudden they're calling uh, calling it a product line. <laughs> like you know, like it is a wow. fucking cell like a big mouth. <laughs> right, yeah. Big so, mouth, quarter pounder. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that's just a trend? Do you think that's just a catchphrase for this particular no, I well, well, I think industry. it's like that, that efficiency expert type of yeah. thing, you know. Okay. Yes. Gonna, it'll be something else next year. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> yes, I, I did change it, but I mean, I think that concept, though, is that once you start doing that, you're turning people into robots, and yeah. I think I think that's not a coincidence that, you, that since it's probably the industrial age, but then the more you get digitalized, and having seen it happen in my own home, it was scary, and, and the insanity that ensues from that. Um, and that in small ways and big ways, it's probably happening um, across our, our world. And in some ways, though, you can say that technology brings people closer together, but in some ways, 
um, some of the books have written that have been written about this have said that it's sort of like the person eats chicken all the a very wealthy person just would only eat chicken and died of malnutrition. So you're not having that the interaction face to face as much. Like really we used to talk more with each other in my field, um, actually face to face. A lot of times now we're writing email to each other and you have to be very cautious. And there's no inflection, there's no you know, there's no you know, sense of the person's emotion very much. So yeah, the email con doesn't cut it. The emo cop doesn't cut. No, 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 it doesn't. So, <laughs> you know, so for, I, I for think real, real human expression. You know. right, but I think there's a, there are many, many areas where you see that sense of loss of the complete person that, that our culture is allowing that to happen, or or that's part of what happens that you lose the um, more human and spiritual and emotional connectivity, and you get this other this sort of uh, digitalized thing happening that you're becoming computer machines, you know, and we're becoming um, auxiliary to our technology. I, I always, um, I always come back to these three points. In, in my angle. No, no, you're not. I'm just jumping in on what she's saying. <clears throat> we don't know where we come from. We don't know why we're here. And we don't know what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just thought that we, we we have disagreements, and so mm-hmm. I guess to create a kind of a you know heaven on earth or whatever or, or a, whatever a, or the thing with the insectoids, we'd have we'd have to agree. We, we, we don't know where we come from. Yeah, we don't know why we're here. Yeah, we don't know what we're supposed to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So we we don't we don't know our source. We don't know our source. We don't know our purpose. We don't know what we don't know our, our destiny. It's very existential. Yeah, so, so... Because we don't all agree, we can't really come together. I mean, it's like countries and nation-states and religions and ideologies and stuff are all positing um, different answers to those questions. You know, if you if you go to a Catholic Mass, you're going to get one set of answers. If you go to a Buddhist ceremony, if you go into a, a corporate boardroom where they're, you know, deciding whether or not to lay off uh, or close a plant, you know, they're they're working by their own set of values. And no one can tell them, any of them. Like, I used to get really mad at the people handing out the pamphlets, the religious tracts, and I try to, I try to steer clear of them now because I realize that while I, uh, I shudder indignantly that they're so righteous about their thing, I realize I can't prove they're wrong. I can't prove Jesus won't come back. I can't prove he will. And I don't have any... Uh, I don't have any basis for any uh, of, like a belief is, is a belief and a fact is a fact. I don't even know if scientific facts really in the end um, hold up beyond a certain point. So anyway, um, to bring my thing around uh, to Bruce's thing, he wants to push, not push, but he wants, he, his idea is, is, is a, I think it's looking at the future optimistically and saying that we have the tools, mind tools, hand tools, to to pull things out of the fire before it's too late. Yeah, we, we might have the tools, but we don't have the, the evolutionary capability because we, we're not grown up yet. Yeah, we got. You know, yeah, a, yeah. And and I think he recognizes that you know the problem with having the tools and not the maturity is that we only have so much time. I'm interested though in what Kat, I'm interested yeah. in Cassie's contribution to the book because I'm also interested in hearing my next contribution. <laughs> yeah, I, I also just wanted to finish with because there are two things I was going to finish with one I forgot to say. That I think there are communities that are unusual, like there's like the like Findhorn or the serious community, like when I get their newsletters or something, I get little blurbs from them. And I don't know if I would ever join a community like that because it's it's more like a you know, it's more like like an like a intentional community. Um, and actually, I think Jack would be happy with a lot of money to buy into those communities. So, um, that's, they, that's not a community, that's a club. It's <laughs> utopia cost big bucks, right? utopia cost big bucks. And, but also, I, as far as the collective unconscious, I think we have plenty of proof that it exists. Not that it's doing everything it can for us, but, um, but basically, if you think about rotaries, you know there's a collective unconscious. There's no <laughs> one can, yes, yes. There's no one can drive through a rotary without <laughs> sensing 
it, the collective unconscious of all drivers. Right. That's brilliant, <laughs> Melissa. Well, wow. Right. The collective unconscious <laughs> proved by... <laughs> Clearly. That's, wow. There are so many, even though there are traffic accidents and crisis, there are so many more if there were the collective unconscious of all drivers, even just of all drivers. So I think we are all connected. If you want to hear Cassie curse... Be with her when she hits the road, gets toward a rotary. You know? I was Just reacting. tune in. Tune in, Cassie. I was reacting to your, what I thought I was hearing you saying was associating human collective unconsciousness with, with the ant's mindset, yeah. with the ant's mega mind. Because I don't think what ants are operating out of is a collective unconsciousness. Yeah, I think they're two very different things. Really? Exactly. Yeah. I, I honestly don't think that. Like I don't think ants have consciousness. Yeah, they're working on a chemical impulse. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But they are connected by some invisible wire. They are connected, wire, but it's, yeah, we don't but know it's what not. It is, and these they're also. connected, but it's not a collective unconsciousness. I don't think ants have consciousness. I think yeah, we. Yeah, but unconsciousness is different from consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, but I just don't Do you equate need, don't you need human collective. In order to have That's a good question. What's that? Don't you have to have consciousness in order to have an un- a, a shared unconsciousness? I, I mean, we don't really I know what so. else happens. I, 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 I personally think, that, no, that's true, we don't. We don't. But I do think, uh, I, I think it, I think it's pretty well known that it's just, it's a chemical thing that they're doing, yeah. But we do a chemical thing, too. For us, a collective unconscious is probably a chemical thing, electromagnetic. It's probably some sort of could very be. large yep. could be. network that we are plugged into. Could be. Cassie, I'm taking the blue pill next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cassie, speak up. We want to hear what you have to say. Well, I have sort of three random thoughts, if I can remember them. Like holding up three fingers, at least. Um, well, sort of touching on what Rick said, I think that it's sort of a, um, a fault of the structure of our society. I mean, just being urbanized. I, like, I've read something or heard something or... Perhaps I'm just making it up, but I think I've heard that um, once we moved past, like, just our conception of numbers and our ability to uh, relate and be familiar with, like, once a group of people gets above 200, there's just no possibility of knowing, like, you can't remember more than 200 names. You can't relate to more than 200 people. Like, 200 is the absolute maximum of what a, like, Mm-hmm. relatable community could be. Mm-hmm. And so I think living in urban places, even if you have a neighborhood or whatever, just like the structure of our society and our cultures sort of makes it impossible to really fall back to the sort of tribal thing. But on sort of the flip side of that, I think that what Victor was talking about about families is true, but not every family is like blood family. Like you, not necessarily your... Well, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be no, blood and family. I know you weren't saying that, but I was, like what mm-hmm. uh, Joe was saying about you can't necessarily say that about every family, but I think that what people do is they, like, like even if you wouldn't necessarily consider the people you see every day your family, like, that, that I think for people who um, don't have anything else, it's like by default, people you work with, the people you associate, like, you have people you know, even if you don't necessarily consider them family, and I think in the absence of an actual tribe, that fills a vacuum, sort of, for many people, whether they realize it or not. And sort of my third random I thought was, um, I sort of, like, I hate seeing people on their phones and stuff, I hate the lack of eye contact and all that, but I hate, I don't like also that we're just blaming technology, I think it's people being lazy. I don't think it's the technology itself. It's it's, it's shitty etiquette. It completely <laughs> it's the people being lazy and not, ill-mannered and not being taught how to uh, like how to be around other people. I mean, it, it's us. It's not the technology. We can't blame the technology. Yeah, the technology but, is us. But is what is etiquette? Is it etiquette or social understanding? An agreement. Yeah, and so if we don't put yeah, agree to, agree that, to our behavior. What's yeah. what's the what's siphoning off? I mean, people might not be directing themselves very well, which is the laziness portion. Because they aren't taught. Because what is la- they're not taught. They might things that they're not taught, or they're taught and they don't. Either, either way, either either people, it's it's the people. It's not the technology. That's all. My point. Anyways. 
The technology is not making them be stupid people. The, the thing is that you know, like the 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 the, the, the gadgets on the on the train thing. <laughs> you know, I remember riding the Boston subway system in the '90s before mm-hmm. there were everybody had a gadget in hand. Mm-hmm. People weren't sitting there chatting like old old friends. No, no, no. They were they were you know without the newspaper or the book or just staring out the window. I mean, there was no to not to, uh, to your point, and I think I agree with you. Technology has not turned us uh, against each other. It's made it more visible. <laughs> it's it's, it, <laughs> it's like we're really not talking to each other because you know you can see the person with the gadget, but if the person didn't have the gadget, you still wouldn't be talking. Yeah, 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 but at least there was still a little bit more of a, uh, a way inwards. If you you right. you can comment to it, the fellow that's reading a newspaper about the Daily News, and he gave you a dirty you, look for looking at his newspaper. You could he paid t- for it, and what the hell are you looking you at? You can see the title of his you. book or whatever, and it's like it, uh, it I'm going to sit over that. here now. I think. <laughs> I think we might. We, would we agree that that a feel that a feeling of belonging, having a group we can call our own or be a part of, these are good things. Yes. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. No, we, but can we also agree that when we when we look at those things, when we look at things like feeling like we belong to a group or that we have a tribe? We're operating out of, well, I, no, I don't know, I don't think we... Keep going, Joe. There is a notion yeah. that groups, I don't know, I like to think of a group and a tribe in a kind of utopian way, sure. you know? Yeah. You know, the, the, but, but there are tribal war chiefs. Mm-hmm. There is tribalism. Yeah. There is tribal feuding, mm-hmm. you know? And, um... We, we can have people with, you know, groups of people that with with with, blue, with brown eyes. Okay, sorry, I don't, you know, I feel, you know, I like brown-eyed people, but I got blue eyes. You know, people that were born in this area, in this area, this regional area. Mm-hmm. Even the insectivores, as they bundled, you know, bundled together. Mm-hmm. You know, found themselves in competition. If there's a social ladder. They, yeah, and they found themselves in competition with the bundle over the hill. Right. <laughs> For resources. For resources. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, but, I, but I think it's wonderful, Doctor, that we would agree that, you know, to belong is a, good, is, is a wonderful aspiration. And maybe it's a human need. Maybe a survival function. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and maybe there are things that we can do to facilitate the feeling. Among I'm more, taking up a strict diet answer. More people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. Like he, he said, you know, he gave his examples. Well, you can, you can bond in uh, a church group. You can bond in, uh, through psychoactive substances. You can bond through meditation groups. You can bond through hugging. Well, all these things. I mean, they're 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 wonderful things. And they do bring us closer together. But that's just a part of the equation, and then you're thrown out into the bigger world. And to me, the challenge and test of our humanity is, okay, how do I bring those moments, those epiphanies and moments of intense belonging, whether it's with my wife, my friends, uh, the cosmos at large, how do I extend that notion indefinitely to make this work better? Yeah. And I think that's something well, well, we're you, always you, up against. But you can't because you you can't because we're human beings. And, well, that's what and, I was saying. And if right. you get and if you it's get locked in a bank vault with your kidnappers, you'll identify with them too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 and you'll yeah, take yeah, that yeah. out to the world. Well, you're absolutely yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but exactly that's, that, that really is what I'm saying. Like, they, I think there's a constant <laughs> interplay on, in the cosmos, and it's it's that interplay that makes life interesting. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are people have said before, oh yeah, Nirvana, wouldn't that be boring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it might not be, but I, I just, to, I think Patsy's pointing this well taken about the 200 people. You, yeah. you can't be in a bond with everybody on the train. Because, and that's urban life, urban life that you do not connect with everyone because it wouldn't be polite. The etiquette is not to bond with every single person on the train. Unless what happens when you tribalize is if the train stops and there's an emergency or someone on the train is acting up, 
that everyone's making eye contact and there's a, you feel that web yeah, of yeah. connection between people. Otherwise, it's not nice to, to try to make a conversation. With it's not nice to be nice. nice. <laughs> you're, so you're being nice by not connecting. I don't know if it's not nice. I think it's not expected. I don't know, right. though, that I would agree that it's not nice. Well, I think it isn't so much... It, it would be annoying and intrusive if someone was insisting on having a conversation with me more than I like thought. Like Victor? Yeah, question? that's me. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I'm lost in the game a little bit <laughs> because there are people from out of town who come from small towns who... Who will have a conversation with you on the tea and stuff like that when they first came out? Yeah, they, they, they are friendly. You always know when there's tourists on the train because they're just smiling the, the and talking to people. The transplants with a friendly. Yeah. But, but really, when you're Fresh coming out, no, because I'm from New York, you know, and, and you know, it, there's etiquette, and the etiquette is that you're not going to be best friends with everybody. Kill or be killed. You know, you're just not going to do it. But there's too many people. It, 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 it overwhelms that 200, you know, that you really need to have your. Um, and I think for me, it's probably like 50. But, you know, um, Maybe seventy of the most for me, but um, but I think that's okay. That's not the, that's not a problem because you can still have your tribe and then interact in a in a nice, friendly way with other people. I think one thing that people do. I mean, they think that's yeah. what's lost. I mean, it yeah. may not but be nice the, yeah. to be nice, yeah. but it's gotten to the point where it's the norm is flat out not even in middle, other it's not even. Yeah, just like... Yeah, well, openness, openness versus hostility. I mean, you know, I, I envy people who can get onto public transportation and they just sort of seem open to the world, at peace with themselves, and, you know? Or, or, or maybe they're just plain stoned, I don't know. But then there's other people, but then there's other people that just seem like they're just hostile. It, it just... It's it flows from that. Yeah, you know? it varies a lot. Yeah, it does, you know, but... but, but that's a human condition. Do people get on the train and they've had a bad day already? Right? Sometimes that's all it is, is a bad day, or they're having a good day, so they have... But they have a good day and then you get on the train, and the boy... You want to increase the one, and you'd like to increase the one, and you'd like to decrease the other, and maybe doctor is, you know, what, what can we do to make... Make the train a more pleasant place well, also for the, the brief time we're a part of that tribe. Yeah. And we probably, I mean, do that to an extent and an extent we don't do it, if, depending on how preoccupied we are. It's okay to be preoccupied on the train, but you have to be mindful that there are other people there. And so it's the mindfulness is important. But also, I think it's very important in terms of if you're thinking about tribe and connectivity and being close to people and having a little group, I think it's important to think about how the group is and how as individuality part of the group like if you get to be a self because he's you're talking about loss of self i heard on an interesting talk by christopher hedges um about um that point about that point in combat because he was a he was a combat um journalist and so um he talked about how he was losing a sense of self being part of this group in, in combat and that ultimately it was bad for his relationships he started drinking a lot um, a lot of things were interfering, it started to interfere, and, and it also became sort of a, a junkie for, for adrenaline rush type thing. You know, so, so um, and he said that it's important to individuate and be part of a community in a way that is, um, is mutual, so that you have a complete loss of mutuality when you have that complete loss of self as part of the group. And that, that you, to be able to relate to family members, wife, child, um, all of that, and best friend and all that, you really need not just to have that buddy experience, but to have um, where you're actually you know, you're, you're giving yourself for a higher cause, but to have a sense of self and to be mutual with people in that way. The ego is necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we need leaders. We need leaders in general, and you know, leaders will have an ego. You know, I keep myself to a nice little select group of sociopaths. <laughs> That's Another my thought I had about the technological <laughs> issue with you know, computers, iPhones, whatever. And I agree with you, what you were saying you know, <laughs> regarding it's not, they you know, per se aren't bad or evil. But one thought I have sometimes when I see the pro- proliferation of people on their iPhones or on the computer is, and this could be a personal spiritual bias on my part, I think emptiness, I think... It, you know, if your mind doesn't have the opportunity to be empty, then it suffers. And I think that the way our culture is now, there's not really many places for people to empty their minds. I don't mean formally in terms of meditation. I mean just that 
you're not, there's nothing coming in. Um, Emptiness isn't it, profitable. <laughs> no, it's not, but I mean, I think that it's... Except for, except for in gardening, where you can't get yeah, anything yeah. to grow. <laughs> but I think emptiness allows... You leave it, Joe? Bye, Joe. Bye. Bye. Good, Good you. seeing you. Great seeing Enjoyed you. Enjoyed your home. Well, 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 through a certain emptiness, through a lack of chatter in your mind, through a lack of stimulation, in ways we don't even understand it, it brings a, an evenness, it brings a, a peacefulness. And I look at people's mannerisms and faces and expressions as I'm out in the subway in the world, and I see people who look like, man, uh, there's just, you know, the sensory overload coming from all directions is yeah. diminishing their opportunity to experience a certain emptiness. Yeah, it's forcing, it's forcing an inner dialogue that's, that's not wanted or necessary. Yeah, so... You don't want to have to think and have an empty... You know, have to entertain themselves or have to do something for themselves. It's 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 yeah. it's sort of a, a built-in ADD sort of thing when you can just right. jump from thing to thing to thing and right. not have to actually use your brain. I mean, right. that's, mm-hmm. that's what they want. But why? Because... It's easy when people are lazy. People are and most people's lives are repetitive and somewhat dull at times. I mean, we do a lot of the same things over and over again. At least the working class. You know, we spend a lot of our time working. working. Getting to work, working, getting from work, being tired, trying to, like, eke out some, like, non-work yeah. time. Yeah, it's yeah. just your own. Yeah, so filling it up with easy... Watching your easy stuff is easier than. I admit, I, I, I peek onto people's phones to see what they're, uh, you know, looking at, uh-huh. and and I could be wrong. It's just random lookings. But the two things I see people look at most at um, are uh, cats those, and porn. No, 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 not, not, <laughs> neither. No games. Ga- games, games, and Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have some, and then some texting. Right. Yeah. But I mean, I see lots of lots of games and and lots of lots of Facebook. And if I think the concept of laziness is interesting because what I is mean, it? Mentally, yeah, I mean, but I think that when you're very compartmentalized, it's easier to kind of drift, or it's easier to be lazy, or um, that that laziness is, it means a variety of things. It could be anxiety, it could be um, fear, it could be um, boredom, it could be variety of, of what, you know, what is laziness, but or, or, but somehow so, and it implies a lack of agency. A lack of responsibility and agency, in a sense. So, but I do think that there's something about what's going on, like both politically and then with the digital thing. There's that combination of things that leaves us without a sense of agency, or right? leaves us feeling complacent. At least for myself, like I was so relieved when when Occupy Boston happened because it was like a, a, an infusion. I didn't even go to it, you know, but I would have liked to in a way. But um, it was this infusion of someone is doing something, people yeah. are coming together. That's the little community that, de- that developed, right? Yeah. Well, of various people. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, too, sometimes just the, the, the concept of laziness is actually just a product of thinking that you can su- succeed at a utopia. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. huh. What do you mean, Victor? What? What do you mean? What did I say? Something about laziness <laughs> and utopia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works. I shoot to try it. I do it all the time at home. Yeah? Yeah, it's called sleeping. <laughs> yeah, sleeping is good. Really in the collective unconscious then and, and more. But, yeah, I was dreaming about English people in China with no pants having dinner. Really, that's what I was dreaming about. <laughs> oh it happens when you don't sleep for four straight days. That's overrated. That's yeah. 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 yeah, I was like, no I was in China, yeah. but there was all these English people there, and they had like all these long tables. Uh-huh. And the people, there was only the old people that weren't wearing any clothes. Yeah. And they're just, you know, eating and. Yeah. I had a random thought. <laughs> not related to that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the, the psychologist Stephen Pinker, he wrote a book several years ago. I haven't read it, but I've read reviews of it. And he, you know, uh, he was saying that as a. As a, a species, we've got we're actually less violent than we were in the past, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's an interesting thing about that. I mean, that, that that's what I think he's leading towards. Okay, what can we do as a species that makes us more harmonious? And he historically laid out all the conflicts in the past and the casualties: World War One, World War Two, and as horrid as the things that we experience now, 
He says, in terms of scale, A, it's less than in the past. B, a lot of it has to do with just the ease of technology. So now we know about what's going on in the Congo, hmm. whereas hmm. two centuries ago there were things going on we didn't know about. Right. So it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting to think, okay, we're just oh. more informed now about the global strife that exists. So it kind of taints our perspective, perhaps, and we think, oh, shit, yeah. you know. Well, maybe we're we less violent because we think that there's going to be, you know, a father figure that's going to find us out. So that's why we're not we're not as aggressive or violent. Is for uh, the threat of being. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, what you're saying earlier. I, mean, I don't think I don't think evolution is necessarily linear. But if you look at it in terms of like social development, we're we're making some progress here. I mean, look at women's rights. Look at gay rights. Look at mm -hmm. other things. Uh, there's still incredible, you know, cruelty and injustice in the world, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that at times I don't feel it, but his premise in this book, getting back to that, was if you really look at historically, you know, especially in terms of wars and conflict, where we are evolving. I don't know. I don't know if I believe it, or, but... Uh, I like that was interesting, though, because you don't believe in free will, and you totally believe in free will, don't you? And that's what you were saying. People can make choices, and they don't have to delay so I mean. Well, I think in your, like, whether you're nice to somebody or not, I think you can make that choice. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just your nature. It's, it's a, you can't defeat it. It just says what right. happens. <laughs> People don't behave predictably. They, they behave coherently. Well, to other humans. Particularly <laughs> to what he's saying, what I was saying earlier, that I don't know if it's the destiny of the cosmos to be a place that is without suffering. Yeah, it's called entropy. Everything is breaking down all the time. Yeah, um, but suffering is a complicated... I think you're right, we were in an imperfect world and the idea that it's a world of struggle. I think it's more a world of struggle than suffering. Certainly there's suffering. But right, suffering right. The one, one is a product of the other one. Yes, right, right. But, there's but I, I, I think that we're here to, you know, to make changes and karmically grow mm -hmm. and all of that. That's what I believe. But, um, I mean, that's another level you can take it. Like, yeah. okay, do you believe? But you can't be up here all the time. I mean, there are different levels of consciousness, you know, so, or awareness in, in, in life. So... So you might be in this sort of zen place that, that you have access to. But you still got to eat. Yeah, you still got to get back here. And you have to struggle with, you know, your family members, your your friends, your your workplace. All these things are going to have some things that you don't like that you have to resolve and, and struggle that's with. That's just part of evolution. And that's evolution. part of life, and it's part of so being human. To learn human, how to better do that. Human. Yeah, and it's how to better do we it. We all fuck up. And, being and, human. and then how to get to a higher level with that. But if you didn't do that, you would just be... Kind of zoning up here. I mean, you don't really need to be zoning. But why be here if you're going to just zone? Right. Well, that's why we have our mythology with our with our angels and demons and all that stuff because they occupy those spaces for us. Nice. I like that. That's great. Well, in Buddhism, the whole concept of bodhisattva is somebody who has gained the game and has decided to come back because. You've gotten to a point where you want to help other people get to better understanding. Right. And that's what I was saying earlier. I think in a certain way, like a state of ultimate perfection, I can't fathom that. You know? I, I don't think. Crazy thought that your thought just sort of made me think of it. So, is it possible that um, humans, like the purpose, is not to get to an eventual parent, like? Like, there's no given possibility of getting to a paradise or happy place because we're not actually, we're not actually, like, natural to where we are. Like, uh -huh. if, like we're friction against the earth, so we're always going to have things rubbing up against us, the struggle, mm -hmm. the suffering. Mm -hmm. Like, somehow it just seems like we aren't necessarily supposed to be... Like, we aren't treating it very well, obviously, but... Right, right. Like, we aren't a natural good fit for where we are. Mm -hmm. So does that somehow affect the end result? If you're always constantly having friction against where you're at, how are you ever going to get to a perfection? 
Mm. Did you do a lot like in terms of Ray's thoughts about um, the ancient astronauts and stuff like that in that sense? I, in any sense. I mean, it just seems like humans suffer and cause suffering to other humans and to the Earth and beings on the Earth. And so I don't think that as a race, as a species, we can come to perfection when we're causing damage and we're causing pain to other beings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's, and that's, a nece- that's a necessary for every species to do. Something always eats something else. Well, then maybe there's no perfection for anybody. No, no. But I think I think part of the problem is, is the fact that there's just too much of this up here. <laughs> we're the ones yeah, who are so, looking for the perfection. And so it's like, you know, you, every day out there, you know, you've got animals and Vegetables and everything that they, yeah. the natural world out there suffers the same way we do, except for we we think it's bigger when it's us. I mean, so you, you see a you see a pigeon out in the park with fishing line around his leg, and his legs like that's been like that. Yeah. The son bitch is still out there eating, socializing. He's not sitting on the park bench whining about this fishing line on his leg. You know, oh my God! If everybody, if I could just get welfare now, you know, <laughs> it's a pigeon welfare. You know, it's like Whit- Whitman has a great poem about that. I think I could go live with the animals. They don't whine. Right? Yeah. Brother Spider doesn't question why he spins. He only spins. But so that it is more. I mean, it's like I'm not saying what we're doing is not natural, and it is. Right. But like we're the ones who are questioning whether or not we're doing things right, and whether like it's mm-hmm. it's our own. Problem. Yeah, I think that part of the question is, is we've magnified what it is to suffer. So what we think is suffering isn't suffering. You know? Suffering is when the pizza guys leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God! Yeah. <laughs> it said ten minutes! That is suffering. Suffering is when your internet's not I got a paper cut on my tongue because yeah. I can send a letter anywhere in the world for 50 cents. <laughs> so with another thought, like what you were saying in terms of, so, so saying that there's a misfit between humans and Earth, but then philosophically, then you have a choice acknowledging that misfit. Then, as an individual, this this goes against your concept of there being no free will. Right. You have a choice then as to do you want to focus on the light or do you want to focus on the dark. Well, it's like shining the flashlight. Where do you shine the flashlight? But you don't have a choice. There's no free will. Parcels on the moon. Do you think we're not meant to be here? It's not, not us, not for us. I'm just, it was a theory, it was an idea that maybe all the suffering is because there's some friction, there's something that's the pants not. don't fit right. It is, a, it is a friction. You're not supposed to wear pants. That's a whole problem. <laughs> well, yeah, that whole right. theory is just, I mean, the whole idea of being in the material world idea was you know, that we're not spirits, we're, you know, we kind of operate bodies and operate systems and create systems in in this way that is sort of like being a puppeteer in a sense but you have to be in your body, you have to embody it. And yeah, they get, it. That's, that's really neat the way you put that like that. That's, you're your own puppet. Who's pulling the strings? Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well that's uh Anybody else saying, have any uh, wrapping up thoughts about this whole thing? Mm. I think we should put a bookmark in because it's, there's just so much to be yeah, talking. Yeah. <laughs> we're, just, we're just talking now, you know, extemporaneously. Extempor- yeah, yeah. We can think about this and have other ideas that I'm sure are going to come to us. Yeah. Good. yeah. Good. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Bruce, for uh, spawning, uh, spawning this discussion. And at some point, you'll hear what we all said, and you'll respond in some way, and we'll, uh, we'll do the ping pong thing. Oh, yeah, ping pong. Mm-hmm. Ping pong? What? Beer pong? Okay. <laughs> Talk me into it. Yeah. <laughs> this worked well, don't you think? The Jellicle Literary Guild did a sterling job debating the issues in the question and gave us all something of value here in the Levity Zone. If you would like to do something similar with a group in your own hometown, just drop me a line here at the Zone and I can record another provocative question for your group to ponder, debate, and hopefully record for a future podcast. I would like to thank Raymond Soulard for his support of this experiment, as well as recording and editing it. Music was provided by Catfish Rivers. 
titled The Moon I Love is Behind the Clouds. See you next time on The Levity Zone at www.levityzone.org or find us on iTunes or SoundCloud under Levity Zone. For your information, the Jellicoe Literary Guild is a project of Script or Press New England, and Raymond invites you to discover more Script or Press projects at scriptorpress.com. That's S-C-R-I-P-T-O-R-P-R-E-S-S dot com, which includes many archives from Jellicoe Literary Guild meetings.